Stop me from heaven, I've taken my stand. I live in the house he's prepared for all of us he spared. Praising his name and giving him back. All right, good morning, guys. I'm Pastor Chris, Crossover Church, Clovis, California. We are so glad to be here with you. Here's my lovely wife. I'll let her greet you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> good to see you. 
All right, today's an exciting day, isn't it? First of all, it's a just, a, just a great day to be in the house of the Lord, but today is a, is a momentous time for us as a congregation because we're going to be celebrating two things today. We recently completed uh, some discipleship classes, and I'm so, so proud of that. I'm so happy about that because we want to produce, in this church, we want to produce self-feeders. Amen? I mean, I, you're not going to survive on just listening to me beat my gums from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. You need to be in the Word yourself, and I'm so excited that people are doing that now. And then secondly, so we're going to pass out some certificates here shortly and recognize those that completed the course, uh, but also at the end of our service, we are going to have our first official baptismal service <laughs> with, I mean, the first one with our new setup, of course. <laughs> We've done many before, but... Uh, uh, just a little word of warning, we have a good problem. I think the, uh, the people that are getting baptized today will say this is a good problem, and that is, is that we actually have a heater in this new unit, and I turned, came over yesterday, got it all set up yesterday afternoon, set the heater and left, came back today, it was like a hot bath. <laughs> so you that are being baptized, no napping. <laughs> this isn't about luxuriating. You know, I know you're going to want to just kind of just relax now. Turn on some bubbles and all that. But uh, anyway, I, I took the cover off just now and turned the heater off. So hopefully it'll be good temperature. So bless you guys. Uh, we want to just go right into uh, the passing out of the certificates for those that finished the discipleship uh, program. I'm going to turn it over to uh, our leaders back here, our Twyla and Dee, who led those two classes. Can we give them a hand, please? <laughs> They will be calling each one of their uh, students up, and I'll have my uh, wife hand this microphone to her, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, good morning. As Pastor said, we are so excited today to acknowledge those who have completed the New Believers Handbook. This handbook is the first class that's offered in our discipleship series here at Crossover Church of God. And the New Believer's Handbook is for a new believer, but it's also for those who have the desire to learn how to grow in their relationship with Christ. The topics that are covered during the eight-week study are understanding our salvation, learning the essentials of spiritual growth, how to read and study the Bible, how to pray effectively, how to be a strong Christian and overcome temptation, the spiritual responsibilities for a Christian, how to know the will of God, and water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. During the eight-week study, participants read through the Gospel of Mark and answered questions each day that pertain to their daily reading. So to those of you who have completed the study, Dee and I would like to say that it was a joy for us to lead you through this study. Yes, I'm speaking for her. <laughs> And to get to observe the growth that took place in your lives. It is our prayer for each of you that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. We pray that each of you will continue on this discipleship journey to be filled with the power of God, to learn how to make healthy, life-giving choices, and to find your God-appointed place of service within the body of Christ. So at this time, um, we would like to begin acknowledging those of you who completed the study. I will start with my group. And first, I want to acknowledge two participants who are not here today. Eric and Maddie Ormandi, so we wanted to acknowledge them as well. Now I would like to introduce Linda Augustine. I just want to get on. Um, thank you, Twyla, and blessings. And I want to thank God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for the blessings I received in this discipleship. Thank you. In Jesus' name. 
It's wonderful, Linda, the joy to do it, this study with you. And at this time, Matt, Mike Doyle. Well, I want to mention. Oh, well, well, thank you for uh, the people that put this together and took the time out of their day to help us. You know, the readings were good. The learning was good. And it reinforced many of the things that I had learned when I first became a Christian in 1984. So thank you very much. Jamie Ross. I'm just so grateful um, to have had op this op opportunity to do the discipleship program. Um, I was able to ask a lot of questions and learn a lot. Um, I thank Twyla for her time and her devotion to um, call me on the once a week, just about, and really get to know me. And I am so grateful for this church and for our pastors and for all the leaders as well as our worship team. Thank you. Now, I had the fun group. I had the challenging group. I had a group. <laughs> you know, I had a lot of, I had the old timers. Uh, and, and just for the record, when we stuck names in a hat and I pulled them out one by one and I kept going, you've got to be kidding me. But these are the ones that I came up and I was, I, they were great. It was a great time because we were older, most of us. There's two of them that I just, I just commend you for what you've done and how much you've grown, all of you. Even the old ones said, wow, we've, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. I did, even leading it. So first I'd like to call up to receive their certificate is Amy Augustine. I just have to say that it has been a blessing to have start, started this class and um, has drawn us closer to God and and also our marriage. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a blessing. Mr. Andre Augustine. Take the church and uh, thank God. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> oh, it's me again. <laughs> I forgot it was my turn again. All right, Anastasia Lyon. Hi, my name is Anastasia. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, sorry, I love doing that. Um, you know, you, you, I'm going to just be really honest because, you know, CR has taught me to do that. Um, the idea of doing a discipleship class when I've been a follower of Christ for 20 years, I went, really? Really? Do you know how much stuff I have to do? Do you know how busy I am? I'm grateful that I was asked, well, voluntold to do this. It was a blessing. Thank you, Dee. Oh, great. She learned so much in CR with honesty. Mike Lyon, Michael Lyon. Yeah, I concur about everything she said right there. But I want to tell you one thing. No matter how long or how short you've been a walker, it is always good sometimes to get back to the basics because we forget the basics and we try to make it too complicated. And remember, you only get as much as you 
can get out of it as much as you put in it. Thank you, Michael. And now, let's see, who's that left? I don't think, I think we got everybody. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Stacy Sarmitz. I'm sorry, I forgot about the Sarmitz back there. Well, I just want to say it was a blessing for us all to be together doing this discipleship class. All of us at different levels in our walk with Christ, um, some more mature than others. And you know what? We're just all at the same level, growing again, being reinforced what we've been taught in the past. Discipleship is really where it's at in the church. That's where I get really excited, you know, hoping to see more people step up and want to go through discipleship classes and to disciple others because that's what the church is about to grow together. And this was just a great group. And I thank you, Dee, for leading this and Twyla. Thank you. Last, but definitely not least, is Mr. Wesley Sarmet. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I learned a lot in uh, uh, the Book of Mark, and I'm still studying it, too, by the way. I got a study Bible. I'm kind of utilizing it. I'm, it's helping me. I never did before. I always thought the study Bible was just a bunch of other stuff in it. And so I'm kind of helping. It's helping me study it. And I enjoy it. And thank you, everybody. And <laughs> All right. Is that it? Thank you. Thank you so much. Give everybody another hand, please, that got their certificate. And I just want to say to all of you, this is not a destination. All this was was to teach you how to do it. So you need to go after it yourself now. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for them, and, I'll, and we'll open up the service. Father, I thank you, Lord, for, for each person that completed this discipleship course, Lord. Like I just said, Lord, it's not a destination. It's not a badge that says that we've arrived. It, it really is just a beginning, Lord, of a, of a whole new life of devotion to your word, devotion to time in your presence, devotion to prayer. May they become those true disciples, Lord, that really go after you and then regenerate and, and uh, produce more disciples, Lord. I pray that we would be a generation, uh, a generating uh, church of disciples, Father. And I just pray, God, for your, for your presence here today. We thank you, Lord, for, for all that's here today, God, and all that will be done, Father. We pray for your presence to be with us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. You heal the brokenhearted. You set the captives free. You lift the heavy burden. And even now you are lifting me. There is no healer like the Lord our maker. There is no equal to the King of kings. Our God is with us. We will fear no evil. Cause you do impossible things. You do impossible things. Yeah. Hallelujah, Lord. Though I walk through the valley, darkness surrounding me. There you prepare a table. Well, in the presence of my enemy, hey! There is no healer like the Lord our maker. There is no equal to the King of kings. Our God is with us. We will fear no evil. Because you do impossible things. You do. Because you do the impossible possible. One word and the walls start falling. One word and the blind will see. Yes, Lord. One word and the sin is forgiven. Cause you do impossible things. One word and the walls start falling. One word and the blind will see. One word and the sin is forgiven. Cause you do impossible things. 
There is no healer like the Lord our Maker. There is no equal to the King of Kings. Our God is with us. We will fear no evil. Because you do impossible things. There is. There is no healer like the Lord our Maker. There is no equal to the King of Kings. Our God is with us. We will fear no evil. Because you do impossible things. Because you do the impossible possible. One word and the walls start falling. One word and the blind will see. One word and the sin is forgiven. Cause you do impossible things. One word and the walls start falling. One word and the blind will see. One word and the sin is forgiven. Cause you do impossible things. There is no healer like the Lord our Maker. There is no equal to the King of Kings. Our God is with us, we will fear no evil. Cause you do impossible things. Cause you do impossible things. Yes, yes Lord. Hallelujah, Lord God. We serve the living God today who is here with us, Lord. We acknowledge you that you are here with us. And Lord, we want to lift up to you this morning those who are sick in body. Father God, we pray for our brother Jerry, Lord. We are asking, Father, that your healing power be released upon his body, upon his knees, upon his ankles, Father God. Strengthen them, Lord, by your mighty power. Father, we lift up to you, O oh God, our sister Linda, who's continuing to look to you in regards to her hip, Lord, the healing of her hip, Father. We continue to come in agreement with her, Father, for the healing of her body. Lord, we thank you that you are moving in our midst. I pray over my sister-in-law as she is recovering from surgery this morning, Lord God. We thank you for each and every one who belongs to the body of Christ. We corporately join together and declare healing today to all who are listening in today, to all who are at home like Monica and others, Kathy, Lord, our sister Linda Augustine, all of those who are looking to you for healing in their bodies, Father, we declare this day that one word from you, you sent your word and you healed our disease. And your word is Jesus. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that healing come forth. And we thank you, Father. We thank you today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance Well, I believe that you are my fortress You are my portion You are my hiding place Oh, I believe you are the way The truth believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe through every blessing, through every promise, Come on now. through every breath I take, oh, well, I believe that you are provided. You are protector, you are the one I love, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, the light, oh, I believe.
Well, it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to you. Because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. Yes, Lord. Well, it's a new horizon. And I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to. Because they can't stay long when I believe you all the way. The way. The truth. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. Well, let you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because I can't stay long when I believe you are the way, the way, the truth. I believe you are the way, oh, the way, the truth, and the truth, the life, the life. Well, I believe you are. Hallelujah, Lord. We confess with our mouth this morning that you are the way, God. Lord, we offer ourselves up to you today as your children. Lord, living sacrifices offered up to you, God. When we hear the word of the Lord, we will obey. When we hear the word of the Lord, Father, we will declare, we will agree with you, God, that you alone are the way and that you have provided a way for us, God a way for us to stand up under temptation, a way for us to be delivered, a way for us to be set free, a way for us to walk in your truth, a way for us to walk in your life. We declare that you alone are God and we have no other. Lord, that we forsake all other gods to follow after you, Lord. We worship you in this place today. And we declare that the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God is here. And we serve King Jesus. And we bow our knee before you today, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And I just want to remind you that if anyone needs prayer this morning, you can always come up during our time of worship. You can always come up to this area of the church right here in the front. And Pastor, myself, others would be more than happy to pray with you. So we encourage you during this next song, if you would like specifically to be prayed for, feel free to come forward. Yeah. Right. It's not on camera.
hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, Lord. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Yes, Lord. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. First one, let's go. When all I see is the battle, you see the victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you.
Amen. If we say that, the battle belongs to you, Lord. Amen. That's true. That's right out of the word of God. Praise God. It's good to be here with you today. Um, I want you to know something that I need to share with you. Um, for over 15 months now, we have been confined at home, and then, you know, we were able to come back, of course, during the pandemic at some point. And there are a few, many changes that happened in our lives, but definitely in our church during that time. And one of the things that happened was we became a live stream church, amen. And it worked, and it got us through, and we're still going to do that because we are reaching far more people than we were able to reach before. But I want you to know that I have straightened up my pulpit. <laughs> I'm preaching, it's a live, I'm going to be re emphasizing. Uh, what's going on here, and we're going to make it so powerful and exciting that people are going to want to come and not watch it. See, that's the problem. I believe we've made it too easy to watch at home, <laughs> and I'm not, I, don't, I don't have any regrets for that, but I know that several, and by the way, those that are watching at home, I'm not taking a jab at you. We love you. I know that there's still several that are staying home, and that's fine, especially with this, uh, whatever's going on with this Delta, whatever variant thing, but um, it is, I want you to know, I'm engaged, and we're going after the Holy Spirit in this place. Amen? And, I, and you just saw, I believe, I believe we're on to something new. I said it a week or two ago. I said, mark it down. That date, I believe that something began on that date, and I'm, I'm, we're going to go after it. Amen? So let's, uh, I have a few things to uh, share with you today. It's going to be a shorter than usual message because we are indeed going to have a baptismal right afterwards. And... Uh, at the end of the service, I'll ask you to just maybe hang around, maybe uh, t take a break real quick, give us about 10 or 15 minutes to get set up. The baptism will happen right behind this curtain. We'll pull the curtain, and you'll see it happening. I ask, I'll ask you to move up at that time, if you can just move up closer to the uh, front so you can see everything, especially the best view for the baptism is going to be on this side, but maybe you want to sit on this side. That's up to you. It's not going to be live streamed. It'll be very private, and um, so that'll be an awesome thing. Then afterward, by the way, we're going to go downstairs and do one of the things that we do well at this church, and that is eat. <laughs> we're going to have, uh, is it still catered from Salsa's? Ooh, there's a little shameless plug for our friends over here at Salsa's. Uh, I can't wait for that. That's awesome stuff. So if you, don't worry about it. If you didn't bring anything, it's not a potluck. We're providing it. We want to bless you. Come on down. And fellowship with us for, for lunch afterwards. Okay. Whew, take a breath. Can I have a half an hour of your time? All right. Because last week we shared an idea that there are, there are a handful of times as a pastor that I've shared things. And I, and I just feel like there was just something special about it. By the way, I want to say that about this last three weeks in our Wednesday night study, especially last week's, it culminated with the big finish. We, went, we talked about end times, what the Bible says about what happens in the end times, what happens when we die, what happens when an unbeliever dies versus a believer. We looked at all of that over the last three weeks. Fear not if you didn't catch it. It's on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. You can watch those, especially last week. Oh, last week's was powerful. I told my wife when I got home, I don't think I've ever studied as hard as I did for that little mini-series, and especially the last one. I wanted to make sure I got it right. Anybody that was there, was it powerful last Wednesday? Man, check that out. But also last week's, last Sunday's message also kind of took it out of me, and uh, it seems like the battle rages during the week, you know, especially when I'm preaching on things where we're kind of starting to take back some of that territory that the enemy has had in our lives. You know, he fights us, and he fights me, of course, as a pastor. I could tell something was up last week, and the message that I brought, <clears throat> many people, more than usual, responded to me during the week about my message from Sunday, about how they felt like it was meant for them. And um, I didn't get a chance to finish it, so I'm going to finish it up today, and hope today is a little bit more practical. So let's open up our usual way, please. If you don't mind, look at the screen and repeat those that phrase after me, I open my heart to receive from the word of God. God's promises are true, and they are true for me. Amen. So 
We are in a series called The Way of Agape. We've been looking at what agape love means. It's God's love. It's not our love. It's God's perfect love, and it transcends anything that's human. It transcends human understanding. It transcends our own abilities, our capabilities of loving. And then we talked about that for several weeks, actually close to six months, by the way. And then we've been moving in now more into a practical application. I knew sooner or later, I felt like when we launched this new series that sooner or later God was going to move me into the practical application of it because if you're not doing something with it, then it's just information. But God's word is not just informational, it's transformational. Amen? We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So God wants to change us. And see, and that's the thing is that when we understand God's love for us, we will want to change. It'll prompt us to change. The more we know him, the more we love him. The more we love him, the more we want to please him, the more we want to change. I want to be different. How about you? See, because within my own flesh, within my own head, I have the uncanny ability to go right back to my junk. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that as a, as a dog returns, excuse me, to its vomit, so a fool to his folly. Let me tell you, I'm a fool and I have folly. <laughs> I go right back to that folly if I'm left to my own devices. So I have to do something different. There needs to be different input going in so that there can be a different output going out. And, and so the idea is that this different way of living, the, uh, it's interesting to me how this last song um, talked about the shadows. You ever, you ever, did you notice that? He, he lights up the shadows. I, I know that was one of the lines from that song. And I know about hiding in the shadows, trust me. Anybody here a shadow hider, <laughs> if that's a phrase? Shadows, we hide in the shadows, in the darkness. Sometimes, you know, it used to be the darkness of our, of our choices and our lifestyle. And, and even as we start pulling out of that, we still have a chance at a, or a tendency, excuse me, to be pulled back into the shadows, into the darkness. But it's usually that as we become believers, it's the, it's the darkness and it's the shadows of our struggle. The darkness and the shadows of worry and fear and anxiety, depression. It still runs amok in the, living, in the church of the living God. We're, we're no different than society in terms of these psychological issues. And I talked a couple of weeks about um, self-criticism, self-even um, hatred, that accusing heart that's in each one of us. And then last week, I dipped my toe in the water of the subject called self-pity. <laughs> Did anybody get anything last week? I'm going to talk. I'm not going to re-preach what I preached last week. I'm just going to hit a few highlights. And I told you last week I was going to share with you something very, very practical. And I want to do that. So let's just get right into it. We said that self-pity is a dark place. And indeed, it is an enemy. That's for sure. 1 John 1, 7 says this in the message version. If we claim that we experience a shared life with him, him being God, and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. But if we walk in the light, God himself is being the light. We also experience a shared life with one another as the sacrificed blood of Jesus, God's son, purges all our sin. What a paragraph that encapsulates the whole gospel message, the whole, I mean, literally, you could just start a church and run a church on that paragraph. In other words, hey, this, this shared life with him, that's just being a Christian. That's just walking in obedience. That's walking with him and talking with him and where he tells us that we are his own. That's the, the time and the word like we talked about at the beginning of service when we were passing out those certificates for those that completed the discipleship. It's not about just completing that class. It's about starting a whole new lifestyle of walking in this shared life with God, communion with God. Why are they called devotions, by the way? You ever think about that? Hey, I need to do my devotions this morning. This morning. You ever think about why it's called that? It's because you're devoting yourself to time in the Word. You're devoting yourself to time in prayer. You're devoting yourself to His presence. It takes devotion because guess what? Otherwise, I'm devoted to whatever's on my mind, man. I wake up in the morning, my mind's a three-ring circus. I'm already behind schedule usually when I get up. I, there's a zillion things I can think of, 
but I'm going to devote my mind, I'm going to devote my time to this shared life that I'm now supposed to live with him where his love is changing me, amen? But it says here, if we experience a shared life and to continue to stumble around in the dark, we're lying through our teeth. Yikes, man. Chill out a little bit, John. We're lying through our teeth. We're kidding ourselves, you know. If this was a Monday night Celebrate Recovery um, study, I'd say, you know, when, when, when we're in addictions, when we're in our brokenness, we're, we're con artists. And the first one that we con is always ourselves. And, uh, and I get that. Lying to our, through, my, through my teeth means that I first lie to myself by saying, I'm all right, it's all good. You know, I'm saved, man. I, you know, I know where the Lord is if I need him. You see, I'm not living what I claim, just like he says. But if we do walk in the light, God himself being the light, we also experience a shared life with one another. Now, all of a sudden, this is, it's, it's kind of affecting our relationships. We talked about the vertical. Now we're going to talk about the horizontal. We'll share a shared life with others. In other words, we're loving others the way that they need to be loved, and I'm not sucking off of them, and I don't, I'm not loving them in a needy way. I'm good in who I am in Christ so I can go to where they are rather than constantly trying to bring people to where I am. I can just love you for being you. I can just be there for you. I don't need something out of you. I don't need you to validate me. I don't need you to make me feel uh, loved. I don't need you to make me feel like a man or a woman. I am just good. See, that's that shared life with one another, see, because we're getting it from the vertical. Now I can handle handle the horizontal. And what is the glue that holds it all together? The sacrificed blood of Jesus, God's son. It purges all sin. sin. That means when we mess up, guess what? God, forgive me. And it's gone. That's why I say it's just circular. It's this, this thing really, I mean, you can form a doctrine off of that paragraph right there. But see, here's the thing. We will never be able to walk in the light if we can't come out of the shadows of darkness. And I'm not just talking about when we get saved. I'm talking about bringing that stuff that's in the dark into the light. Self-pity will keep us in the shadows as much as anything I can think of. So when we... When we think of self-pity, what are we talking about? Of course, one of the first things that comes to mind is feeling sorry for ourselves, right? Licking our wounds, that victim mentality, curse, nurse, and rehearse, right? It becomes an expectation of a bad outcome. More on that next week. I've already written next week's message, too, and it's uh, more on this subject. You ever heard that term, waiting for the other shoe to drop? I'll be hitting on that. I, I, I touched on that several years ago. I believe God's got given me some new insight on that. Waiting for the shoe to drop. What's that all about? It's an expect, expectation of a bad outcome. And see, here's the thing. Self-pity is a deep unhappiness related to our problems. It's all problem-based. But see, the problem is not our problems. <laughs> the problem is what we do with our problems. The problem is always what we do with our problems. It's not a matter of stress. It's not about what happens to us in life. It's about how we react to what happens in life. Tell me anywhere in Scripture where it says Jesus promised he's going to make it all a rose garden. I remember that song from the 70s. I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose. Boy, I'm showing my age with that one. (laughs) Anybody in here under 40 is going, huh? You too, but it's on there. God, Jesus never promised us a rose garden. In fact, he said the opposite. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. So it's not a matter, our our walk with the Lord, our maturity in Christ, our our growth, our, our goal as a Christian is not the elimination of problems. It's not the elimination of struggle. It is changing our reaction to said struggles. It is changing our reaction to said problems. It is so that I can look at you in the eye and say, you know what, six months ago, if that would have happened, I would have been launched off a cliff. But you know what, I'm all right. In fact, somehow or another, I feel better for the thing that I was cursing six months ago in my life. I said those very words to God. I remember one time there was something that happened to me that was such a personal punch in the gut, like, unlike anything I've ever experienced. And it, it, it laid me out. And it just happened to be on a Friday afternoon, and it just happened to be when my wife was out of town for a few days. So it just happened that I, I was faced with a, 
a, de a dilemma. I was faced with a decision. Am I going to go into the self-pity party? Am I going to cr crawl back in the bottle or go back to my old stuff? Or am I going to do, which, by the way, I did, thank God, I got home, literally pulled the curtains, literally changed clothes, sat down on my recliner and wept like a child for probably a half an hour, poured my heart out to God. And that is when I opened up the word and I just asked God, God, I need something now more than ever. That's when the, the, there was a one particular song that just really lit up for me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me as my enemies, my foes who will st stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, I will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. And then get this. One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to seek you in your temple and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. For in the day of trouble, you will keep me safe in your dwelling. You will hide me in the shelter of your sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. See, what are you going to do? What are you going to do in those times? You're going to stay in the darkness or you're going to come into the light. See, I said, the Lord is the light of my salvation. That was a way of saying, I am choosing to come out of this darkness and celebrate the light. And then, for, and then therefore, I can say, whom shall I fear? This thing that, I'm, that, is, that is so hard for me to deal with right now, God, I don't know, understand why in the world you let it happen. One of the hardest things I've ever dealt with. Went right to the core of my woundedness, by the way. It really, I mean, God has a way of doing that. Exposed something, I healed. I got so much stronger because of it. And then, one day, I'm not kidding, this really happened. One day, I was riding on my motorcycle by myself. And I was coming home, and I was crying out to God, which is, which is often why when I ride by myself, I'm either just airing out or I'm, praying or both or whatever. And I said, God, I, uh, when this happened, Lord, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, it felt like, or one of them. I didn't understand what you were doing. But now, Lord, I can honestly say, thank you for letting it happen. Because I see that I'm better for it. See, as God's making us comfortable in our skin, He's also thickening our skin. Because those arrows are not going to stop flying. So I said that. I related it. I said that out loud over my pipes and my music. And the Holy Spirit reminded me. I'm serious. It really happened this way. I said, I just felt like I just got some love. And the Holy Spirit just spoke in my mind and said, by the way, what's today? I thought about what the date was. It never even occurred to me. It was a year anniversary to the date of that time, the thing that happened. In a year, I was, a year later, I was rejoicing for the very thing that I was cursing the year prior. See, he wants us to, that's part of coming out of the dark and into the light, is, is realizing all these things that want to keep us pressed down. Our, well, if we're, if we're obedient about it, if we'll call out to the Lord instead of crying in self-pity, God will do something good out of it every single time. But see, again, I say self-pity is problem-based. And here's the issue with that. We are under the stronghold of self-pity when we identify with our problems. That's what we always do. When you, are, when you hunker down and that's all you can think about is your problems and your struggles and your weakness and the things that aren't in place in your life instead of the things that are in place in your life, you will at some point in time start identifying with them. It just stands to reason. What does that look like? Okay, say so you need a job. Say so you need some finances so for whatever reason. You're facing that. Okay, that's a, that's a darkness, man. That'll, that'll already press you down. You need a breakthrough. 
A good biblical way of doing that is, God, God, I need to show your glory in this situation, Lord. You have promised me that you are my provider, Father. You will indeed move in this situation. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. Meanwhile, Lord, strengthen me in my weight, in my faith as I wait on you. Or, what we all will often do, lick our wounds. Well, I don't know. I guess this is just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if, you know if, I don't know if God's going to do anything. I got this problem. I need a job. I need a job. I need some finances. I need some money. Blah, 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 blah. Whatever it is, we focus so much on that, we will eventually start identifying with it. I guess I'm just not employable. I guess this is just how it's going to be. I guess this is just who I am. See, that's the problem. We always will do that. And in this state, guys, you can come to church, you can quote scripture all you want, but your face tells the truth about how you really feel. If I have time, I'd tell you about the emphasis or the uh, silliness of trying to minister with that kind of mentality. Trying, we want the best for other people. We're not believing it for ourselves. Don't even try. You don't. It's a waste of time. You're trying to sell a product you're not using. I've been there, trust me. <laughs> I know. But it's a stronghold. Here's another point. Self-pity becomes the voice that we hear over God's. <sighs> Boy, I wish I had time to unpack that one. See, this is the way that usually plays out. We try to come out of the shadows and walk in the light of God's love, but self-pity drags us back down into the darkness, doesn't it? It's like it's got its tentacles wrapped around us. Dragged us right back down under. It's like we're trying to swim. We're trying to tread water when there's an octopus underneath us. <laughs> Eight tentacles just pulling us down. So indeed, self-pity is a mindset. It's a stronghold. It's a stronghold that cripples our faith. Another inherent problem with self-pity is that it involves comparing ourselves to others. Think about it. The very definition of self-pity means that you're looking at your situation relative to someone else's, <laughs> right? If everybody was exactly as miserable as you are, then it would probably seem normal. But they're not. Apparently to you, in your mind, you see others being blessed. Hey, where's mine, Lord? So it, it obviously involves a comparison to somebody else's. And guys, that's dangerously close to jealousy. We talked a lot about that last week. I'm not going to re-preach that. Check out last week's if you missed it. But all this to say that self-pity causes it to make it about us. And guys, that is just plain and simple self-absorption. Sometimes maybe we feel justified in all this. Because another thing about self-pity is that it's fueled by a perceived breach of justice. Right? What do I mean by that? Well, just simply this. It's not fair. <laughs> Kids know all about that statement. Trust me. It's not fair. It's not fair. They got that, and I didn't. How come it's not fair? It's not fair, but we do that. It, that's really what drives a lot of this idea of self-pity. Comparison, and it's not fair. If I had time, that would, I would get into the idea that that's just uh, basically questioning that God is a God of justice. You really want to, if, if you find yourself struggling with that question about it being not being fair and there being an injustice, do me a favor. Look up every single phrase in, uh, in the Bible that has to do with the word justice, vindicate, vindication, and write them down and read that and let it get into your noggin. Because if you can do all of that and, not, and walk away still questioning God being a God of justice, there, there's a spiritual problem there. He has promised us that he will vindicate us. What does that mean? That means he'll fight for our cause. He has promised us that he is a God of justice, that blessed are all those that wait upon the Lord. See, that's the problem. We don't want to wait. <laughs> when we don't want to wait, we take matters into our own hands, and then our lives just perpetuate problem after problem after problem after problem. 
Well, I don't understand, Pastor. I prayed about it. It just seems like it's getting worse. Well, what are you doing while you're waiting? Well, I, I had to do something. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. But perhaps the biggest problem of them all about self-pity is that self-pity shows a lack of trust in God in general. Self-pity means that you're not trusting God, period. Look at this, Isaiah 26, 3. Now, this is getting into the area I didn't have time last week to get into, okay? So everything up to this point has been a review, review, and hopefully you've gotten something out of it again. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose mind are, minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Now, if that's true, the converse is also true. If you don't trust in God, then if your mind is not steadfast, if there's no peace, maybe that's the problem. And you cannot be steadfast. You cannot be in perfect peace when you're not trusting God and you're giving in to self-pity. Self-pity is the antithesis of what I just read. What does that mean? That means the opposite. But see, it's literally the converse of this. But I want to be that guy. Oh, God, keep me in perfect peace. God, my, I want my mind to be steadfast. What does that mean? That means that no matter what's going on, Lord, I'm fixed on you. We just sang it a minute ago. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. So what does that mean? We sing these songs. You ever think about what these words mean? What does a new horizon mean? That means it's a new outlook. <laughs> I got a new outlook, man. I'm going in a new direction. I got a new, when I look off, I see something new. It's not the same old, same old. I want to go into a new path. And I can do it when I'm set on you. I can do it when I'm steadfast and I'm trusting in you, God. But when I give in to the self-pity, when I give in to the victim mentality, when I give in to the stuff where I just kind of see myself as damaged goods and woe is me and all that garbage, God, I'm not being set on you. I'm not in perfect peace, that's for sure. And my mind surely isn't steadfast. I'm all over the place, Lord. So I said last week, we got to stop excusing this. Amen? We must stop excusing self-pity. If it doesn't align with the truth of God's word, it's got to go. I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe you just need to invite it over to meet you at Starbucks. Let's have a sit down. Break up. Some of us need to break up with this stuff. It'll be all right. It's good. You know, just kind of have that little talk with them. At some point in time, self pity is going to look across the table at you and go, there's someone else, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there is. Sorry. I'm, we're just, I just see us going in different directions. It's got to go. If it doesn't align with the truth of God's word, why are we coddling it? we got to start calling these things what they are. If it's not a, okay, well, let me take it a step further. This isn't in your notes, but I'm just going to say it. It's a sin. Not trusting God is a sin. It's amazing how we, like, we want to help those people with the drug problems and all that, but, you know, we got our own little sins that are a lot less, you know, on that rank, you know, that scale that we have, you know. No, it's not as bad as what those people do. Sin is sin. Thank you. Jesus went after that, didn't he? Didn't he, say, didn't he go after that kind of stuff? You say you've, you know, you know that the law says you thou shalt not murder. Well, I say if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, you've already committed murder. <laughs> See, he has a way of going after that stuff because we hide and we like to rank our stuff. Well, I don't do what those people do. Kind of like that person on the street corner praising God that he's not like, you know, like, um, thank you, Lord, and I'm not like those people. Lack of trust is a sin. <laughs> We've got to stop excusing it. I want to show you in the time that I have remaining, which is not much, I want to show you an example. I want to take you through the Word. And if you want to turn in your Bible, I'm going to have it on the screen here, but if you want to turn in your Bible to Psalm 73, this is perfect timing, fits so well because the beginning of our service, we gave out all those certificates to people that completed the discipleship courses. And I told you, 
I said, guys, this is the beginning. This isn't, a, this, this isn't a destination. This is not something you hang on your wall and you're good. Because you, I tell you what, you gotta, you've got to understand how to get in the Word. I explained a situation a minute ago in my own life where I came home, threw the drapes, turned off the lights, I cried out to God, and I opened up the Bible. And it gave me life. Speaks to every situation. Jesus, when he launched his ministry in the book of Luke, he was baptized by, the, by uh, John the Baptist there in the, in the Jordan River. And then he went in to the, the synagogue and launched his ministry. But before that, what happened? What happened right after he was baptized? This is a hard one to get, man. It says the very next words after God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased and the scene of the baptism there on the, in the river, the very next words in the Bible are this. Then Jesus was led in the, into the desert by the devil to be tempted. What? Jesus? By the devil? I mean, by the, uh, by the Holy Spirit? Let What? You see, he had to go through everything. The Bible says that he endured everything as we endure it and was yet without sin. This is all part of the preparation. But God indeed will let us go through things. He'll let things happen that in our lives and we'll be play, uh, faced with that decision. Am I going to wallow in self-pity or am I going to fight as Jesus fought? Because how did Jesus fight in the desert? What three words did he say? It is written. It is written. It is written. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. This is an example of what you can do. This isn't just pastor stuff. You can do this. Psalm 73, it's an example of a psalm where the psalmist expressed most of what we've talked about today and last week. It's about self-pity. It's about a cry of injustice. It's about jealousy. He processes it in a healthy way, and then he brings it back to the truth of God's word. This is one of the best examples I could possibly show you. Let's just get right into it. Psalm 73. Let's just start out. Verses 1 through 3. Surely God is good to Israel. You could put your name there. Surely God is good to Chris, to those who are pure in heart. Okay. God is good. So far, so good, right? But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. In other words, he's saying, I'm stumbling over what I saw when I looked at others, Lord. I got, into, I got my mind go, went somewhere, God, and I almost stumbled. And now, by the way, comes the confession. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he's admitting his jealousy right here, right? Okay. Verse 4. Look at this. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. <laughs> Who cares about them? <laughs> I mean, see, again, we talked about that last week. I'm, I'm, I don't want to re-preach last week's, but when we're in self-pity, we're oftentimes comparing ourselves to others. What does it matter to you what, what they get or don't get? That's them. It's not you. But we do. We make it. We look around, and it's like, well, look at God. They're, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy, strong. It's not fair. <laughs> That's what that's saying. It's not fair. The wicked just seem to prosper, Lord. Verse 5, they are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. They don't seem to have a care in the world. Verse 6, their pride, therefore pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves in violence. From their callous hearts comes, comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. God, these, these people clearly disregard your word, Lord, right? Look at the, the next year, verse 8. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. In other words, these are big, arrogant talkers, Lord. They're snobs. We can talk about snobs here. <laughs> No fear of the Lord at all, right? Look at all the time he is spending talking about other people. Why? Because he's jealous. There's some self-pity going on. Look at all the thought 
I mean, it's, I said last week, it's almost kind of creepy when you think about it. We're almost like stalkers in a way. You're thinking about, and you're sitting there just figuring out these other people and how good they have it and just imagining yourself being them. It's almost kind of creepy, really. Look at all the time he spent. No fear of the Lord at all. Verse 10, therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. In other words, they have a devoted following, Lord. People are actually buying their nonsense. I try to say something, Lord, nobody even listens to me, but look at them. Verse 11, they say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? Boy, they're, now they're, let's talk about how defiant they are, right? They're defying God. This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. <laughs> so they defy God, but yet they continue to prosper. Do you see what I'm saying here? This is one of the best examples in the Bible of jealousy, self-pity. Verse 13, surely in vain I kept my heart pure. Oh, now, okay, now he's bringing it back to himself. <laughs> see, here comes the pity party, right? Here comes the self-pity. Surely in vain I kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and yet, and every morning brings new punishments. <laughs> you ever think about that? Same day, different, or uh, different day, di same thing, right? In other words, man, woe is me, right? Man, Lord, I've kept your word, yet I am miserable. And look at them. If I had spoken out like that, I would have been, I would have betrayed your children. In other words, you wouldn't let me get away with that. Anybody ever heard you say that, somebody say that to you? You wouldn't let me get away with that. Hey, Lord, I've been over here. Man, it sounds a lot like the, uh, the older son in the prodigal son story. All this time I've been right here. You never threw a party for me. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. I don't get it. <laughs> I just don't get it, Lord. That's all right. You might as well say it out loud and feel it, right? Now, I love this. Get this. He's making a turn. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. What is that saying? Then I came to you and I prayed to you instead of giving into all this other stuff. I came into you and I prayed and you opened my eyes. Surely you placed them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. In other words, their comfort isn't exactly what it seems. How many times have we said lately, what are you going to do when evil, when it looks like evil is winning? What you do says a lot about your faith. We've got to remember, and we learned last Wednesday night, did we not? We know the end of the story. <laughs> we officially now know the end of the story. And there's a lake of fire waiting for all those people that you think are getting away with it. Society, a culture that's just shaking their fist at God. We've just, we, 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 we live in a culture right now that just oozes of self-importance and self-arrival. That, that self-actualization that just assumes that we're smarter than any God on how to run people, how to run a country, how to run a culture, what's real, what's truth, what's valuable, what's relevant. Yeah, all of those people that are shaking their fists at God right now, their day is coming. And see, the psalmist here got it when he spent some time in the Lord, with the Lord. He realized, hey, their comfort wasn't exactly what it seemed. Look at verse 19. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors? They are like a dream when no one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. In other words, they're going to be poof, they're going to be gone. Like a vapor, gone. In other words, their time is coming. The destiny of the wicked is determined. They're not going to get away with it. What, that, what, what I just described to you, that aha moment is when we realize 
that God is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait upon the Lord. That is the prescription for the illness of self-pity. I'm going to say it again. God is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait upon the Lord. Get over it. Look at verse 21. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. In other words, I'm a mess, Lord. <laughs> I am messed up. I am jacked up from the back up. <laughs> Every other thing you can think of. I'm full of self-pity, Lord. I'm full of jealousy. God, forgive me. Now look at verse 23. I love this. See, this is the process, guys. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with, with your counsel. And afterwards, you will take me into your glory. Okay, what is, that? what is all that saying? In spite of all this that I've just laid out to you, Lord, I just basically open my mouth and let my brains fall out. I, yet, despite all of that, I am with you and you are holding me. <laughs> you will help me. And ultimately, I'm going to be with you forever in heaven. <laughs> I'm yours. Now, I love this. Songs have been written from this next line. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, oh, so many times, by the way. My God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God, there's no one, there's nothing like you. You are my strength. You're all I need. That's bringing it back. That, you might as well just express yourself. That, you know, by the way, after this whole, why is this psalm in the Bible? If it was sinful, it wouldn't be in the Bible. It's showing our humanity. You feel this way, you might as well say it, but bring it back to God. That's the reason it's in the Bible. It's for teaching. The Bible says for all Scripture is God-inspired, God-breathed, and useful for what? Teaching and rebuking and all, you know, all other things. This is good. This was written thousands of years ago. I need to hear this today. There is no one like you, God. There's nothing like you. You are my strength. You're all I need. Then check this out. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. Just get that straight. They're not winning. Evil's not winning. They're going to get theirs. God is a God of justice. But as for me, it is good to be near God. <laughs> draw near to the Lord, and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee. You're going to resist him on your own? I got this, man. I got this. George Lopez, I got this. Yeah, right. Let's see how that works. My whole life is an example of me thinking I got it and just one meltdown after another. Every time I've had a meltdown in my life, it's because I thought I had it. I got nothing. But as for me, it's good to be near God. That's all, you, that's all you have to do is just get near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of your deeds. Let me summarize how you could end that psalm. I believe the psalmist is saying basically, God, just a few minutes ago, I was wallowing in self-pity. But I got in your presence, and you reminded me who I am and whose I am. Thank you for being my refuge, my rock, my strength, my fortress, my deliverer, my very present help in time of need. You are my shield. You are my strength. You say that out loud. You say that out loud. You say that out loud, and you see what happens to your heart. 
See what happens to your spirit as it's lifted up out of that mess, as he pulls you out of the miry pit, as he pulls you out of the clay and sets your feet on solid ground. That's exactly what the psalmist is saying right here. I got in your presence and you reminded me who I am and whose I am. Thank you for being my refuge. I want to tell others of your goodness. You see how that worked? What did I do? I literally just went line by line through the Word of God. And look how the Holy Spirit takes it, makes it real and applicable right where you are. That is the remedy. So what's the, here, I'm going to wrap it up here. First of all, con- confess yourself pity to God. That's an, that, it, literally what that psalmist just did. You know, it took him 28 verses to get there. It's all right. Whatever. He was real. That was real, you know. Might as well say it anyway. But see, it's more than just agreeing with. That's what a confessing means, is agreeing with. Freedom comes when we break with these things. See, he brought it back to God. We've got to break with them. We've got to for- forsake them. I heard recently somebody used the word evict. <laughs> I like that. You can evict these things. Kick them out. Part ways. It's like it's a train car on the train of life. You're going this way, and it's a car. Just unhitch that dude and leave it there on the track, and you're going another direction. Stop trying to get it saved. We're t- we try- Too many times we try to Play around with our stuff. Repackage it. Put perfume on a pig. Just leave it there. You cut ties with it. Right? There's a word called renounce, and I'm going to close with this. Renounce. It means to formally declare one's abandonment of something to reject or stop using or consuming. We need to stop using and consuming self-pity. Drinking an elixir, man. You're drinking the Kool-Aid every time you do that. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses them and renounces them finds mercy. See, it's one thing to just say, hey, my foot almost slipped, Lord. Oh, boy, that was close. But it's another thing to say, God, I'm going to go, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure I don't do that again. If, if I walk down this sidewalk every day and there's a hole in it and I keep on tripping up, at some time in my knucklehead life, I'm going to realize I need to st- go down a different street. You know, if you're hanging around people that cause you to stumble, stop hanging around them. If you're, if you, if you're in a situation that's causing you to get, get bound up, get out of that situation. Formally declare one's abandonment of something. Reject it. Stop using it. Consuming it. Part ways with it. And then you want to just replace the lie with the truth of God's word. Exactly what I just ran you through just now. Real example of how to do that. Did you guys get something from this? Sorry, it took me a little longer to get through this, but I think it was good. I think it was good. Bless you. Let me pray. And then we're going to take about, what, a 10-minute? Oh, (laughs) got so carried away, I forgot about communion. Do you, does everybody have elements? You should have been given elements when you came in. We invite everybody to partake with us. You don't have to be a member or, a, or anything like that. Um, but we just do, that you, we ask that you do it with sincerity and, a, and honesty with yourself. It's a good time to get clean with the Lord. Okay, you know how to use these complicated things? (laughs) Pull back the top layer. It's a very, very thin layer of plastic that exposes the the bread. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Hold your bread up. It tells me me that you were successful in getting it open. All right. This bread represents the blood of the body of Jesus Christ, the body that was broken for us freely and openly, voluntarily. He offered his body so that, to take the beating that we deserve so we could have the grace that he deserved. Amen? Let's eat the bread. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. Oh, let this bring us nourishment, Lord, more than just in a nutritional standpoint, a spiritual standpoint, Lord. And strengthen our faith, Lord, knowing that you took the sacrifice. It's already done. It is indeed finished. Likewise, pull, pull the next layer back to expose a little bit of that juice. See if you can do it without spilling it. I just did. If, you, if I can, you can. Trust me. If there's anybody that's going to spill, it's going to be me. A little comment, maybe. Um, <laughs> we just read in 1 John 1, 7 that when we're walking in the light, God himself being the light, we also experience a shared life with one another. That's what we're doing right now. We're sharing in the Lord's Supper. As the sacrifice blood of Jesus, God's Son purges all our sin. That's what it's all about right here. The blood of Jesus that continues to cleanse, continues to cleanse. What a great time right now to get clean with the Lord. Right now, whatever, whatever it is, right now you put it under the blood of Jesus. What does that mean? That means this. Lord Jesus, forgive me of that sin. Cleanse me with your blood right now. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. We thank you for this juice that represents your blood. We know that your word says the life of a creature is in the blood, so as we drink this juice, may it give us life. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand. He's good. It's a good day. All right, now, now we'll go ahead and say, give us a, give us a, a 10, 10, 10 minutes or so. Let, the, let them change. And if you don't mind, like I said earlier, the best viewing spot for the, the baptismal is going to be probably in these first three or four seats here. It has a good angle that way. Just a suggestion, but uh, we'll see you shortly. <laughs>